word out to people. So why don't we talk about cancer? That's really the question. So, so as we all know, cancer is a big problem. According to the American Cancer Society, there will be uh, nearly 2 million cancer cases and over um, 600,000 cancer deaths in the United States um, this year. That number continues to grow. Cancer is currently the second leading cause of death in the United States. And a lot of experts are predicting that by 2030 or at least by 2035, it's going to be the leading cause of death overtaking heart disease. So it's definitely um, a pandemic when you think about it. Um, when we look worldwide, there are over uh, 10 million deaths from cancer every year. And um, we've all been affected by cancer, right? Either either, uh, either cancer you've had yourself or certainly in a family member or friend, we've all been touched by cancer in some way. So when we talk about research, there, there's been a lot of research over the years when it comes to cancer. President Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971. It was this big deal. And they, they pledged $100 million for, for cancer research to try to find a cure. Uh, but, but of course, since then, we, we've been, you know, 50 years or 50 years since then, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars on cancer research. And we've made some improvements. Uh, there have certainly been some advances, but we still don't have a cure. Um, and you could even argue based on some metrics that we aren't any closer to a cure now than we were, um, you know, 50 years ago. So we have a lot of work to do still. And if we look at the field of, of oncology and cancer treatment, you know, one of the biggest problems we have is, is groupthink. So um, a lot of doctors and researchers are trapped in this system that, that really just promotes the status quo. And when we look at progress in medicine, especially in oncology, it happens very slowly. Um, there can be a new idea, but by the time that idea gets funded, uh, gets researched, um, data is collected, um, and that whole process is kind of worked through. I mean, it, it can, it's usually years, right? I mean, it's, you know, six, eight, 10 years, a lot of times before a treatment is, is investigated and, and sort of approved for use. And so my approach is we're dealing with life and death here um, with cancer. So, so let's be more proactive. And so I like the approach of open-minded skepticism. And I learned that in that master's degree program at Georgetown. Um, we have to be open to new ideas and treatments and therapies, but we also have to have a healthy level of skepticism. So we have to really balance those two. We can't just have one or the other. We, we can't be so closed-minded that we're just not open to anything we're not familiar with or anything maybe uh, as a physician we haven't been trained in. But we also have to balance that with skepticism. We cannot believe everything we hear. There's so much misinformation um, and, and really just falsehoods out there, on, especially online when it comes to cancer. And so we can't be so gullible that we're just sucked into every new idea that we hear about either. So that balance where we're using science um, as a guide is, is really helpful. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to start by talking about what cancer is and what it is not. A lot of people have an idea of what they think cancer is, but but I found that a lot of people um, are a little bit misguided in terms of what it really is. So um, we're going to define that really well. We're going to talk about how to prevent cancer in the first place. If you don't have cancer, I want to make sure you do all that you can to prevent yourself from getting it. And then we'll talk about how cancer is treated today. Um, and certainly if if you are someone on the on the conference today who has cancer, uh, you're going to want to know about that because, uh, you know, what is the standard of care, but also why it's really not optimal. There's some things that we, we can do to improve that current standard of care for the treatment of cancer. Uh, and then certainly, how can we optimize that? We're going to use integrative oncology to do that. So I'm excited to go through all this with you today. So to understand cancer, we have to start um, with a basic understanding of the cell. And so we know that cells are the basic building blocks of life. When we look at the body, there are you know, there, there are estimates that there are about 100 trillion cells in the body. There's a lot of cells. Um, they're, they're all carrying out various specific functions. Um, and then cells grow. Uh, that's the, A healthy cell is going to grow. It's going to multiply. And then it's going to reach a certain age. Um, it's going to sort of slow down. It's going to stop working as well. And then it's going to die. That, that's how a healthy cell goes through its life. That's, a, that's the right thing we want to happen. But we know that sometimes uh, normal, healthy cells can become sick. They can mutate and they become abnormal uh, and they don't work properly. And so what we see if enough of those mutations happen um, is, is cancer because that, that cancer cell behaves very differently from that normal cell. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but when we talk about cancer, uh, it's, it's 
technically defined as a collection of over 100 diseases. And uh, these diseases are all characterized by uncontrolled growth and division of abnormal cells. So when enough of these cells sort of coalesce together and join forces, um, they form a mass or a tumor. And so we diagnose cancer based on the location within the body where it originates. So uh, of course, if, if the tumor starts in the breast and we term it breast cancer, um, even if it spreads to the liver or the bones, it's still breast cancer. Um, if cancer starts in the colon, it's colon cancer regardless of where it spreads. And of course, as tumors enlarge, then they can, they can invade nearby structures and they can cause problems. They can cause pain. They can cause dysfunction in, in, in terms of how the body's supposed to be operating. And of course, if this process is left unchecked, cancer can spread to other parts of the body. And that's what we call metastasis. So the main ways that cancer spreads are either through the bloodstream or through the lymphatic system. And so, you know, tumors will have a good blood supply and a good lymphatic supply so that if it continues to grow, it's, it's going to, to spread other places. And when we talk about people who die from cancer, it's typically due to metastasis. So it's typically due to the, the cancer getting uh, larger and larger in that original area and then going somewhere else. Of course, there are some cases where um, the it doesn't spread and people still pass away from it. And that's just because it's gotten so big that it's um, you know pressing on critical structures in the body and things. But typically, when someone dies from cancer, it's because the cancer has spread to, to other places and, and caused uh, a big problem. So over 20 years ago, there was research uh, by uh, Dr. Weinberg and Dr. Hanahan. They they defined what are now known as the hallmarks of cancer. And so they looked at cancer cells and, and really outlined what distinguishes them from normal healthy cells. And so I don't want you to get too bogged down with this, but, but this little graphic kind of shows the various um, attributes of cancer that, that make it unique and different uh, and dangerous. But uh, kind of starting at the top, uh, there's something called sustaining proliferative signaling. And so that's really where um, cancer is able to, to uh, continue to promote its own growth, um, uh, evading growth suppressors. Normal cells have um, uh, restrictions in place to keep them from growing too much or too fast. That does not apply to cancer. Cancer can grow and grow and grow and grow without stopping unless we do something to stop it. Um, activating invasion and metastasis. Cancer likes to invade nearby structures likes to take them over and it likes to go other places. Normal cells don't do that. Normal cells will not invade nearby structures or spread other places. So if someone has a benign or non-cancerous tumor, it's not going to behave the same way as a cancerous or malignant tumor. Enabling replicative immortality. So that's basically saying that cancer is going to continue to grow and, and divide forever and ever unless we stop it. It's immortal. And then again, normal cells don't do that. Normal cells will undergo what's called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death when they reach the end of their uh, you know, functional uh, lifespan. Inducing angiogenesis, that involves blood supply. So cancer likes to promote the growth of new blood vessels, arteries and veins to, to help provide it new um, blood supply because cancer has a lot of needs for nutrients. And so cancer needs oxygen and fuel and all kinds of other things to help it sustain its rapid rate of, of growth and spread. And so it needs new blood vessels. So angiogenesis is the promotion of new blood vessels to feed that cancer and those tumors. And then resisting cell death, again, cancer doesn't want to die. It has mechanisms in place to keep it from, from dying. And so resisting cell death is a key part of that. So those are kind of the big hallmarks of cancer that were identified a little over 20 years ago now. And since those hallmarks were defined, uh, the, the researchers uh, looked back at the research and they actually added two more. Um, they added abnormal energy production and they added the ability to evade immune system detection. So abnormal energy production means that cancer can use various sources of energy uh, quite well in order to uh, continue to grow and thrive. Um, it has some, some different ways of producing energy that normal cells typically don't have. And then the ability to evade immune system detection is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, cancer has ways of cloaking itself from the immune system. So a lot of people are, are misguided and they say, well, if I just had a stronger immune system, I could, I could fight off cancer better. And there's a little bit of truth to that. I mean, certainly the immune system, you can kind of help um, a little bit with, with cancer. If, if it's forming, maybe the immune system can see an abnormal cell and kill it. But for a lot of cases, you know, the, the cancer is sort of hiding, it's cloaking itself and the immune system can't see it. And that's because some of those mechanisms in place cancer has, it doesn't want to be identified. It wants to keep doing what it wants to do. So 
So basically, we know that cancer uh, is something that grows very quickly. It overrides the growth restrictions that are present in normal cells. It can use a wide variety of energy sources. It can escape immune system detection. And its goal by doing all this is to uh, invade the body and ultimately uh, spread through the body until it overtakes it. So how does cancer form? That's really one of the biggest questions. A lot of new patients in my office say, well, Dr. Stigall, how did I get cancer? And a lot of people think that cancer is a genetic disease. It's just bad luck. It's, you know, you got the genes you got from mom and dad and, um, you know, you, you have your, your, your Delta hand and that's what you have. Um, and cancer is related to genes, of course. I mean, when we look at cancer, we know that these genetic mutations have contributed to the cancer and are at the source of cancer. But what we found is that cancer at its source is not a genetic disease. Um, over really up to around 90% of cancers seem to be caused by lifestyle and environmental factors. And so um, when we think about that cancerous process, it's not just one exposure that causes cancer. It's repeated exposures, repeated damage to cells over time throughout your life, over the decades that leads to cancer. And so I think we need to really think about cancer as a disease of aging rather than uh, just a genetic disease. Because if we look at most cancers, the risk goes up as you get older. Obviously, there are some exceptions with some, some pediatric uh, you know, childhood cancers, but for the most part, the risk of cancer goes up as, as people get older. So in terms of reframing how we view cancer, let's stop viewing it as a genetic disease and let's go upstream a little bit and talk about what actually causes those genetic mutations to happen. And so this is where the field of epigenetics can really help us because epigenetics is the study of how our genes respond to the environment. And scientists have learned that our genes are always responding to the environment that they're in. They, they, they're almost like an on-off switch. They're either on and they're doing that certain genetic activity or they're off and they're not. And so we obviously want to make sure that those beneficial genes are turned on and make sure that the harmful ones are turned off. That's where life...